Hello, and welcome back to Dagish America Presents. I'm your host, Ben Harl, and I'm so happy to have this opportunity to talk to you about the industry that I work in. Last episode, we spent some time talking to James Miller about stored product beetles, and if you haven't had a chance yet, please go back and give that episode a listen. In today's episode, we're going to change gears a bit and talk to Blake Buckner about identifying and controlling pest mammals, specifically rodents. Blake is currently the business development manager at Degish America and has several years experience in the fumigation industry. So please help me welcome Blake to the podcast. Blake, as always, it's absolutely wonderful to have you join us. Yeah, it's great to be back. Appreciate it. Okay. For anyone who has not listened to our podcast previously, and you're on every season, which thank you for that. I appreciate it. Uh, but for anybody who hasn't listened to our podcast before, uh, just give kind of a brief introduction to who you are and what you do. Sure. Uh, Blake Buckner, again. I'm currently the business development manager for Dagish, based here out of uh, Weir's Cave, Virginia. Been with Dagish this time for just over five years, but been in and around the fumigation pest control industry for right around 20 years. Okay, so definitely experience. You've ran across some insects and some stored product pests in your career, right? <laughs> More than I care to express. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the topic that we're going to talk about today, it's a it's a pest that we don't talk about a lot. Typically when we talk about fumigation, uh, our main topic is stored product insects. But today we're going to talk about, I don't want to say it's overlooked because fumigation is used to control this pest a lot. So I don't want to say it's overlooked, but a lot of times, you know, we don't go into a, a great detail about this particular pest and that's any species of rodent that we use fumigation to control. So I was hoping to pick your brain a little bit about, you know, the different rodent species that we run into and, you know, some good inspection techniques and, and really kind of how to effectively control them. Okay. Yeah. Sounds great. Perfect. All right. So the most prevalent rodent that we deal with on a regular basis in homes, in food processing facilities and restaurants, I mean, these things are very, very widespread, but that's the, just a common house mouse. Sure, Ben. The house mouse, it, it's a relatively uh, small mammal, rounded in shape, and it's it's got a pointed snout. And, and by small, I, I mean the adults, they're, they're generally around three to four inches, and they generally weigh less than two ounces. Um, so they're just little guys. Now, relative to their overall size, they do have sort of large rounded ears, and then a two to four inch tail. The tail is basically equal to their body length, and that's something that is, is important to remember. It's equal to their body length generally. In coloring, they vary all over the muted spectrum, um, all the way from gray to, to light brown, even to black at some points. Their hair, uh, which is actually called a goody, is, uh, is short. And it's important to note that the ears and tail of the house mouse are they're usually hairless or mostly hairless. Some of the subspecies of the house mouse will have a lighter colored belly, but not all mice will have this identifier. Just remember that many subspecies are there, but there are really only five main types from my perspective that can generally be classified sort of by geography. Either way, it should be relatively easy to identify adult mice from their other rodent counterparts. So to put the house mouse sort of in a nutshell, they're small, uh, rounded bodies with a pointed snout, and their tail is equal to length, and they've got big ears. Okay. Yeah. It seems to, like they should be pretty easy to identify. And, and I think most everybody that's worked in our industry has seen house mice in a wide variety of environments. So I, I don't think we're, we're, we're not reinventing the wheel by identifying them for sure. <laughs> I know that, but for any newcomers, I mean, I think you gave a very, very good description on, you know, what the house mouse looks like, you know, and right. to add to some of that too, I think it's equally important to be able to identify them by look, but also, you know, kind of understand some of their life cycle, their life habits and things like that. And what makes the house mouse so successful in the human environment, so to speak? And I mean, they thrive really under a wide variety of conditions. And they're, they're the most common rodent that we see. You know, I mean, they will forage outdoors during the spring and summer. But unfortunately, we really do create ideal environments for them. You know, we provide them with a food source. We provide them with a water source. We provide them with heat in the winter. So even though they will go outside and forage in the summer, I mean, if they find a nice habitat, 
that provides everything that they need indoors, they're going to live indoors. I mean, that's just what they do. They're shy, so you won't see them out and about during the day a lot, uh, unless it's a huge infestation, of course. And they like to feed on unattended food. So spillage, things that are, you know, under racks, behind things, things that fall down into, into holes and cracks and crevices and things like that. That's what they're going to be looking for. And they feed on a wide, wide variety of food types. I mean, really, they're equal opportunity feeders. Anything that we eat, they'll eat. <laughs> so all of you <laughs> out there, keep that in mind when you're inspecting facilities for rodents. Most rodents will eat whatever we eat. Now they have favorites and not favorites and things like that, but if they're hungry, they're going to eat anything that we eat. I can wholeheartedly agree with that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, some of the things that you want to look for when you're uh, inspecting for house mice, they do a lot of damage. Most rodent species have teeth, their front teeth, they grow uh, and they never stop growing. So most rodent species have to continually chew on things to kind of file their teeth down to keep their, their growth under control. So <laughs> you'll see these things, you know, so you'll see all kinds of different items chewed and gnaw marks on a wide variety of things inside structures when you're looking for these things. You know, everything from electrical wires, you know, marks on wooden furniture or construction supporting elements. You'll even see you know, damage on textiles. I mean, these things will chew on about anything. And they're always looking for nesting materials too. So you'll find a lot of chewed up things that they use for nesting materials. And two of the biggest indicators that you have a rodent infestation or you have rodents in a facility are droppings. It's very easy to find rodent droppings or house mouse droppings inside facilities where you have an infestation. And then the other thing, too, is uh, most rodents have very weak bladders, so they actually will uh, u urinate while they're walking around. So with the help of a UV light, a lot of times, not, not all the time, but a lot of times you can actually see if there are urine trails to indicate the presence or absence of rodents. Now, keep in mind, a lot of things will glow with UV light, so that's not a surefire method, but you can use UV light to find urine trails for rodents. So if you're finding, you know, glowing uh, urine trails mixed with gnaw marks or rub marks mixed with rodent droppings, I mean, that's a really good indication that you have some kind of an infestation. Yeah, it, I couldn't have said it better myself. And generally, if you have an infestation with rodents, particularly mice, you'll smell it. Ooh, I'm glad you mentioned that because I didn't mention that. The odor. Yeah. If you have a large enough infestation, the second you walk into a facility, you're going to know it just with your nose. There's a very distinguishable odor when it comes to rodent infestations. House mouse specifically, when you walk in, you will know if they are there just with your nose. So there's a couple other rodents that we deal with on a pretty regular basis as well that I want to talk about. And that's a couple of different species of rat. What can you tell us about the Norway rat? Sure. Norway rats, you know, sometimes they're called brown rats. They're larger than house mice and roof rats, which, which we'll discuss that in, in a moment, I guess. But Norway rats are, are generally six to 11 inches long, uh, not including their tails. Their tails are just over four to nine inches long. They weigh from five ounces to over a pound. So they're pretty big and their bodies are thick and, and they're heavy bodied. Some of the key identifiers other than their adult size are their snout and their tail. They have a flatter, more blunt snout and they have little beady kind of eyes relative to their size and, and their ears are small as well. Their tails actually will be shorter than their bodies and sort of beefier and thicker in diameter than that of a mouse. And as you can guess from the nomenclature, the, the brown rat, their natural colors range from gray to brown. Usually they're scattered sort of black hairs mixed in with their fur. And depending on their genetics, some can even appear almost black. Their undersides generally lighter, being gray to white and um, even sometimes yellow in appearance. So to sort of summarize the Norway rats, large and thick bodied, uh, blunt snout, small eyes and ears, and their tail is shorter than their bodies. Yeah, and that's a good way to identify them if you find a deceased Norway rat. Um, it's pretty common for people to take their tail and kind of fold it over across the top of their body. And if the tail does not go past the head, it's a pretty good indicator that you have a Norway rat on your hands. And like you said, their snout is very blunt. They do not have a pointed nose at all. It's a pretty blunt uh, nose. And they're a large I mean, these things are very big. It's one of the biggest rodent species that you're going to run into in pest control. So they're 
pretty easy to identify compared to house mice and, and roof rats, like you said. So, and you they're know, everywhere. And, Oh, yeah. They're, and it, they're, they're everywhere. <laughs> yeah, and I'm glad you said that because you're absolutely right. They are everywhere. We see Norway rats all the way throughout the United States. They live in a lot of sewer areas and they like dark areas. Again, they're very, they're curious, but they're timid. So they're similar to house mice in that they're cautious, but they're somewhat curious. They will go out and forage for food in an area that's about 50 to 75 feet away from their nest. But just like with the house mouse, you know, if they find an area that has a concentrated food supply and, you know, plenty of water, plenty of heat, they're going to want to stay in that area. They're not going to want to wander too far away from their food source. But they do use regular runways to get from one location to another. They are habitual. So when it comes to finding an infestation, you can usually tell where they're going because they use those same regular pathways. And most rodents secrete kind of oil through their fur, and so you'll see what's called rub marks along their paths. So if they are going through holes or they're walking along a wall and their fur is rubbing against that wall, you'll see these rub marks. And they're very distinguishing if you know what you're looking for. Uh, it's just that kind of a dark streak, like this oil mark that goes along walls, or you'll see it around holes, like I said, where they're going into or out of walls or, or floors or anything like that. So you can tell. And just like with house mice, you can use, you know, carefully, you can use a UV light to follow urine trails to kind of follow their pathways as well. And they will leave droppings too. So again, a lot of the indicators for rodents are the same across the board. The only one that kind of stands out a little bit differently is the roof rat, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. But as far as inspecting for house mice and uh, Norway rats is kind of similar but I would say that Norway rats are a, probably a little bit more cautious than house mice. So, and they're smarter than house mice, <laughs> considerably smarter. So trapping them or catching them can be considerably more difficult than it is with house mice. It's a little bit of a stretch, but it's almost like they, they live in the shadows and they know that they're in the shadows. That's why they, they really like the, the alleyways and the sewers and they don't stray, as you said, as quite as much as a, as a mouse, and, and they do that for a reason. Yeah. You know, I think most people know this, but, you know, the biggest concern that we have is, you know, they can carry pathogens. I mean, we all know that rats, specifically Norway rats, I believe, if memory serves, consider to be responsible for the Black Plague that happened back uh, in the 1300s and 1400s because they carried it from city to city, you know, through the fleas that lived on them. So, they will carry pathogens from place to place. And I mean, they're equal opportunity feeders. You know, if there's a food source available, they're going to crawl into there and they're going to eat that food source and they could contaminate that food source. And that's really the biggest reason why control of all of these rodent species is so critical. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. No doubt. All right. So now we'll talk about the one rodent that is a little bit different than the other two, in my personal opinion, is a little bit different than the other two, and that's the roof rat. So what can you tell us about the roof rat? Yeah, I, I can agree with that. Um, roof rats, you know, sometimes people will call them black rats or ship rats. They're five to seven inches long. Their tail is, you know, just over five to eight inches long. They weigh two and a half to eight ounces. Roof rats are smaller than Norway rats, so they can be described as more thin or slender bodied when you compare them to a Nor Norway rat. So of the big three that we're talking about, they're sort of in the middle uh, as far as size goes. They actually, they have a pointed snout and larger ears than the Norway rat. So you can sort of tell them apart that way. Their coloring is generally darker. They have sort of scraggly black fur in many cases. So roof rats, you know, they're smaller than Norway rats. They're, they're slender bodied, but, but they're usually larger than mice as adults. They have a long sort of scaly tail and uh, a pointed snout. Their ears are larger than the Norway rat and their eyes are larger than the Norway rat. Yeah. And I think the thing that really in my mind distinguishes them from the Norway rat and the house mouse is where they choose their environment. What I mean by that is they are climbers where Norway yeah. rats and house mice, they'll, they'll climb when they need to, but roof rats prefer elevated spaces. Amazing climbers. <laughs> Yeah. So, and that's some of the reason why they call them ship rats is because they're typically found along coastal regions. Uh, we don't see uh, roof rats 
in areas that are inland too much. Typically, they're along coastlines. You'll see them along the east coast. You'll see them along the west coast. You'll see them around the gulf. They're very much associated with ships. We see a lot of roof rats on ships, but they're climbers. So we'll see them in a lot of elevated areas. So you'll see them on the upper levels of buildings. You'll find them in drop ceilings. You'll find them in attic spaces, wall cavities. Uh, they prefer to travel and nest above ground where a house mouse and a Norway rat prefer to be either at ground level or below ground. Yeah, actually, actually Ben, you know, being a fumigator, I've, I've seen far more roof rats on ships than on roofs. You know, it's, it's extremely common to see them scurry up through the ropes of the ship where it's tied off there on, on the dock and, you know, just jump right aboard. I've, I've seen hundreds, thousands of roof rats on ships. So yeah, it's really, really, really fascinating to watch them climb. And the fact that they prefer elevated areas and to run along roof lines and to run along mooring and rope and things like that makes them a little bit more difficult to catch and control because they choose to live in areas where it can be challenging to use normal control methods, you know, snap traps and things like that. I mean, now I've seen a lot of folks, you know, zip tie them to elevated areas where the roof rats are, you know, where you can see where they're running. Because just like with Norway rats and house mice, you will see rub marks along their travel path, but you're not going to see it at the ground level very often. You're typically going to see it in elevated areas, but you can find that. You can find the urine trails, you can find the rub marks, and then you can actually zip tie or mount snap traps along that, that travel path. But with roof rats, they're, you know, I mean, all rodents are curious, but they are extremely cautious in my opinion. So trapping them, it can be very difficult. Yeah. I'm, it's interesting you said that it's fumigation and, and pest control by and large, anytime you add height to the control method, it adds a layer of complexity. You know, I've, I've seen them in barns and silos and grain bins and stuff like that. And it makes them difficult to identify, control. They're definitely the most difficult of the three to identify and trap and bait and control. Yeah, I would agree with that. Now, the thing that I think works in our favor when it comes to controlling these rodents is they're very easy to eliminate with fumigation. True. Absolutely. Absolutely true. Yeah. I, I guess just to back up a little bit as a fumigator, I, I don't know that I would, I would recommend swinging the big fumigation hammer first, but just as with all infestations, you have to sort of take an IPM approach to controlling rodents, you know, start with the sanitation and cultural controls. Rodents can squeeze their way into the tiniest of openings. I mean, mice can fit through openings as small or smaller than a dime. So start there seal up any openings that are larger than a quarter of an inch and, and pay attention to your door sweeps and, and floor drains. Then from there, you know, we can sort of move on to the physical controls, which would be baiting and trapping. We could spend an entire podcast talking about baiting and trapping. Then you, you would move on to the next step if those prove to be ineffective, which would be the chemical controls. That includes rodenticides and pesticides. And, and as you just said, fumigation. And this also deserves its own podcast. But uh, I'll say from a fumigation perspective, if all the IPM steps are sort of ineffective, a fumigation, as you said, is extremely effective in controlling rodents. Usually the dosages are, are much lower, control mammalian pests than insects, and the kill rate is usually 100% when you apply it correctly. So, you know, you sort of start with keeping them away with sanitation and keeping them out with exclusion. Then if they're in and you find an infestation, you can try baiting and trapping and if the infestation's grown too large and the other methods aren't really working to, to bring your thresholds down, then you move to the chemical control hammer, which would include fumigation. So, Yeah, and I agree with everything that you said. You always want to follow the integrated pest management approach first, because if you can control them without the chemicals, that's always going to be favorable. And in all honesty, I mean, who wouldn't want to you know, try sanitation and structural exclusion first. I mean, you know, if you clean your facility up, it's going to be much more well-rounded anyway, regardless of just trying to control rodents. Sanitation is always a good practice. Uh, you, really, you really should be doing that anyway. I'm sorry to, to interrupt you a little bit, but you really should be doing that anyway. Even if, if you do have to use fumigation, you should still be sanitizing and excluding because you run the risk of reinfestation more quickly if you don't use those methods. So. Absolutely. And that's kind of what I was getting at. So yeah, right. I, I, and I agree 100% with that. The good news is rodents, because they're so easy to control with fumigation, if you have a facility where you are already choosing to fumigate 
for insects, any insect species at all, the, the amount of fumigant that you need to kill any insect is going to far exceed the amount of fumigant needed to control rodents. So rodent control is kind of a byproduct of insect control when it comes to fumigation, which is wonderful news. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I've fumigated for insects and when I go back in to start the aeration or do my final walkthrough for clearance or whatever, that I'll find several rodent species that are dead inside the structure as well, <laughs> just because it works so well against rodent species. Almost without fail, you'll find some sort of uh, evidence of rodents when you fumigate for insects. And I'm glad you said that, Ben, because from a fumigation perspective, that's a good conversation to have with clients. If you're going to fumigate for rodents, it's probably a good idea to inspect and try to identify if there are any insect infestations so you can knock out two birds with one stone. So it's, it's sort of a good thing to, to discuss with your customers and your clients in advance in those meetings before so you can really just knock out the entire infestation. Now, I won't say that it's a 100%, but generally the conditions that lead to a rodent infestation will also lead to an insect infestation. So it's a good idea to try to cover both of those bases at once, if at all possible. No, you're absolutely right. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. You know, And like I said, that's good news that it takes such a low level of fumigant in order to control rodents. Keep in mind, everybody, though, from a safety perspective, you know, rodents are mammals and so are we. <laughs> so if it takes a very low concentration of fumigant to kill rodents, it takes an equal low concentration to kill us. And that's the reason why respiratory protection is so critical when using fumigation. Yep. Insects are a heck of a lot tougher than us. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Their respiratory system is completely different than, than ours. So, you know, keep that in mind. That's the reason why that respiratory protection is so important uh, to utilize when fumigating. Um, I only have one more question for you, and you've been on every season so far, so I know that this is a question that you're used to answering. <laughs> so what advice would you give a new fumigator when it comes to identifying and controlling rodents? So somebody who's fresh to the industry, what advice would you give them? Okay, well, I'll, I'll sort of stick back to the identification, sort of a summary of it. I, I would say the biggest thing is try not to rely on color because it, it can vary so widely across the species. I'd really stick to the tail to body ratio, the size of the ears and eyes, and something that we didn't really discuss at length, uh, you touched on a little bit. It's a good idea to research their droppings. Those can be used to identify uh, what rodent you're dealing with as well. Really, the one thing that trips many applicators up is not necessarily in adults, but it's between young rats and mice. Again, you go back to the head. Young rats will generally have larger heads and their rear appendages, their legs and feet, will be large as well, larger than, than that of a mouse. So that as far as identification, like I said, I would just don't rely on color and, and stick with their other identifying features. Uh, as far as controlling them, back to the IPM. Go with the easy methods of exclusion and sanitation and then move up from there. You know, I'm really glad that you mentioned the physical characteristic differences between juvenile rats and house mice, because that's a, an important thing to consider. I have ran into situations where I've talked to people who have misidentified uh, juvenile rodents, mistaking them for house mice because juvenile rodents are small. You know, they grow the same way that we do. So a juvenile rat can be mistaken for an adult house mouse. But you're absolutely right. Looking at the head, looking at the rear feet is a really good indicator on whether or not you're dealing with a house mouse or a juvenile rat. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's uh, all the time we have. Blake, thank you again for taking some time out of your busy schedule. I know how busy you are. <laughs> we work for the same company. Uh, but <laughs> thanks again for taking some time out of your busy schedule to help us understand and identify rodents much better. Yep. Never too busy for you, Ben. I appreciate the opportunity. I want to thank Blake for giving us some insight into the three most common rodent species we see in our industry. Fumigating for rodents is a common practice, so understanding their habits and physical characteristics is extremely important to guarantee successful control. On the next episode of Dagish America Presents, we'll be talking about another group of pests that can prove to be challenging to control, but more from a regulatory perspective rather than a physiological one. Quarantine pests. And remember, if you have a question you'd like for us to answer, please feel free to email us at podcast at degishamerica.com. Or you can also find us on our website at degishamerica.com or on all of the main social media outlets. 
And so, until next time, I'm Ben Harl, and I hope you have a safe and terrific day.